And so we will begin with uh, implementation updates from California, Illinois, Washington State, and Oregon. Uh, Sarah Gill, who is the moderator for this session, uh, she, uh, as her full-time job, is the Senior Legislative Representative with AARP, uh, which has been a wonderful partner, collaborator, and supporter uh, of these efforts at the various states, and it is certainly uh, no exaggeration to say without AARP's activities at the various state, uh, uh, at the various states, we would not have the 10 states that are currently uh, enacted legislation. So, congratulations to AARP and and uh, to Sarah, to um, uh, Jerry, and to all of uh, their colleagues here from uh, AARP. So, Sarah, let me turn it over to you to introduce your panel. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for um, coming out here either to Seattle f just for this meeting or following NCSL. I know it's been a long couple of days of meetings, so thank you for your time and attention. Um, this panel is gonna be focused mostly on um, what the state folks have to say in terms of the legislation they've passed as well as the implementation process that they're going through in the next few months. And the hope is that um, they can share their wisdom with everyone in the room who is working in other states. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, introduce everybody and then we'll do um, a few minutes from each state so they can tell you what's going on, um, what happened in their, in terms of political climate when they passed the legislation and what they're working on now. So we uh, have got um, the California State Treasurer, John Chang. Um, we've got Julian Federley here to my right. He is with the Illinois Treasurer, um, Illinois Treasurer Frerichs' office. He's the Chief Policy and Programs Officer. Did I get that right? Okay. Um, Senator Mike, Mark Mullet, excuse me, from Washington State, and also Treasurer Ted Wheeler on my left. So I'm gonna kick it off um, with California. Well, thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, and thank you, Hank, for the invitation to be with all of you. Uh, a, a brief update about what's transpiring in California. So our secure choice uh, legislation was signed by Governor Brown in 2012. The author was current state Senate President uh, Kevin DeLeon. Uh, in the earlier iteration, Kevin wanted to approach, or he did approach CalPERS and wanted CalPERS uh, to do investing. Uh, I am one of the 13 trustees of CalPERS. Uh, our staff was very concerned about uh, tax ramifications, uh, losing our tax status or potentially jeopardizing it, so uh, Kevin took a different direction. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the legislation was signed in 2012. Uh, it, ERISA cannot apply. Uh, uh, that's one of the designs for going through the political battles in California. Uh, as in many other states, the financial industry was very concerned. The insurance industry was concerned. Uh, there was some also some concern by labor, uh, not the same type of concerns. They were concerned about a movement uh, away from more defined benefit plans, and so weakening of the retirement security for the individuals uh, in California. And so that legislation was signed, and so the it, it was uh, what it required is that the plan be self-sustaining, and so no government support, so we had to go out and raise money, and AARP sir, was incredibly generous, along with the Arnold Foundation, SEIU, uh, Ford Foundation, and others, so we raised about a million dollars and so the plan requires that we do uh, a, market, uh, a market analysis, a uh, fee, uh, program design, and legal feasibility. Uh, we hired Overture earlier this year to do the market analysis program design uh, work. Uh, we're scheduling, scheduling policy briefings in critical areas through each month this year. And then uh, KNL Gates is our attorney. Uh, earlier this year, we went back and we went uh, to uh, Department of Labor, met with the Secretary and others. Uh, he was very uh, supportive and so forth. We're deeply appreciative to the Department of Labor to try to work out the issues. It was a big concern for us. Uh, we are trying to get the program design completed by the end of the year so that we can make a recommendation to our legislature. Uh, the legislation requires that we go back to the legislature so that the legislature can uh, uh, introduce a bill and enact it and get the governor to sign it. So we're concerned about the timing of it. The features of the plan that we're looking at, it's, uh, it would have automatic enro uh, enrollment. We would have the opt out. We wanted portable, low, low cost, uh, low risk um, for the members. Uh, in California, it was designed basically for the 6.3 million people who do not have uh, a retirement plan offered by their employer. 68% of the people who fall into that category are minorities. Uh, in California, it's about 46% of the population uh, fall into this universe being Latino. 
and there's a heavy, also large numbers of women uh, that would, would benefit if we have some type of plan uh, in California. Uh, as we go through the focus groups, some of the things that are of concern, as we, we noted, uh, was that uh, the low-income individuals were very concerned about making sure that they, they could uh, take money out at any time because of the emergencies that occurred to, to them. And then they were very concerned about loss of principal. And so we were thinking about, you know, how do we ramp up? Do we put in a more conservative plan at the beginning so that they don't have that fear of loss of capital at the outset? What do we do in regards to emergency situations? And so that's uh, part of the, uh, we thought were very interesting aspects uh, to what was transpiring. And so Secure Choice Board, and there's nine members, uh, by virtue of the fact that I'm the Chief of Administrative Board, there's also the State Controller, there's a representative from the Governor's Office of Finance, the Senate, Senate Rules Committee gets an appointee, uh, the Assembly Speaker gets an appointee, the Governor appoints a business representative plus three others. So that's <coughs> the membership of the Secure Choice Board. Uh, so we would be basically the entity that would be responsible for the operations of uh, uh, this program that goes forward. And so that's a little bit of what's transpiring in California. Great, thank you very much. Let's move on to Illinois. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, first of all, thank you for moderating. Um, Hank, thank you for having us. Um, the only thing I heard from Secretary Borzi's speech was that you're now gonna write the rules and regulations <laughs> for us. I hope I, I think I speak on behalf of everyone up here that we're certainly endorsing that, so. <laughs> Uh, no, but thank you. Uh, Treasurer Frerichs wishes he could be here today. Uh, however, he is hosting a conference in Chicago <coughs> in uh, conjunction with NAS on the implementation of ABLE. So he, he uh, sends his regards. Um, Senator uh, Dan Biss, the architect of uh, the Secure Choice legislation in Illinois, um, is actually still in session right now. Um, there's an overtime session in Illinois. You may have heard about the uh, uh, budget disagreement going on in the state, and he uh, 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 he wishes he could be here as well. Um, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of Illinois' model um, and uh, talk a little bit about what we've been doing uh, to to implement. So, uh, first of all, you know when we're talking about uh, the problem, we, we've we've all seen these facts and figures, and I believe it was. Linda earlier who was speaking to uh, the median savings for, for workers. If you look at the median savings of workers who don't have an employer option provided to them, the median savings is zero. So again, if, if an employee doesn't have an at-work retirement option, their median savings is zero. Uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty stark figure. Um, this, this fact, uh, along with several of the facts and figures that you've heard today, is really what motivated Senator Biss, uh, as well as, at the time, Senator Frerichs, to, to champion this legislation. Illinois, uh, like your state, is, is uh, in, in a bit of a mess when it comes to retirement security. About 50% of people in the state uh, aren't offered any type of uh, retirement security plan. Um, what we have... Uh, what we've done at the treasurer's office is start to look at who is really uh, going to be most impacted by this legislation um, and by, by secure choice. And if you look at this figure uh, on the screen here, this is a breakdown of the estimated number of workers in Illinois uh, who don't have any type of retirement plan. Now this is data that we collected in collaboration uh, with several governmental entities as well as some private entities. Um, and, and the figure is fairly stark. It's 1.2 million people. Now that's a, that's a very conservative estimate. Uh, on the upper end of our estimate, we think there's about 1.5 million people who, who don't have any type of at-work retirement option. So that's, that's the state of the problem in, in Illinois. Uh, Secure Choice was signed into legislation uh, just this year by Governor Quinn. Uh, it was one of the last bits of legislation that was signed uh, in, his, in his administration. Um, the, the law is fairly straightforward in terms of its applicability. Um, it applies to employers that have 25 or more employees that have been in business in Illinois for at least two years and don't currently offer 
any type of retirement savings program. Um, Secure Choice provides an automatic enrollment uh, as, as, its, as its primary feature. Um, we, we refer to it as an automa automatic uh, payroll deposit. 3% uh, of the worker's paycheck automatically goes into this Secure Choice um, the Secure Choice plan. Now that's the default. Workers can choose to opt out. They can also choose to uh, raise the amount of money that is being uh, default invested. Now as a part of the legislation, the percentage that they are contributing to their plan can't, um, can't exceed uh, certain um, IRA limits, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a fairly robust and flexible plan. Uh, this plan is also, by design, open to enrollment for individuals um, who work at employers with less than 25 employees. It, it can be open to anyone. Anyone who wants it can, can enroll. Um, now, I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides because it gets into the nitty-gritty in terms of the financial, uh, financial product that... that um, uh, that Secure Choice offers, but I do want to stop on this slide because this this offers uh, a look into what the legislation specifically references as options that must be provided through Secure Choice. So there must be some type of life cycle funds. So you know some examples of those are age-based funds where you know there's a target retirement uh, age. Uh, another example is a target fund where you, know, you say you want to retire by the year 2050. So life cycle funds must be uh, provided. Uh, there must be conservative principal protection funds. So you know, those, are, those are money market accounts or, or bonds. Uh, growth funds, again, small, mid-cap, large-cap funds, blended index, uh, and, and blended index funds all fairly standard um, investment vehicles. There's also an annuity fund that must be included, and finally, a secure uh, return fund. Now, this one is the most interesting uh, because the legislation doesn't really say what a secure return fund is. Uh, it's just you know, broadly defined as a fund whose primary objective is the preservation of the safety of principle and the provision of a stable and low risk rate of return. Um, so again, th there are several different uh, financial products that are prescribed as a part of the legislation. Um, there are some, some limits uh, set on uh, fees, 75 basis points. Again, uh, I think that's in the ballpark of what, what uh, some of my compatriots up here have in their states. Um, secure choice uh, is really um, not only about just the the individual worker. Um, you know, if you look at the <coughs> impact that Secure Choice is going to have on the economy as a whole, um, you know, th these figures on the PowerPoint really represent the total impact that some of our um, estimated uh, re uh, retirement accounts are going to have on the on the economy as a whole. So. Uh, an Illinois worker retiring at the age of 67 with $173,000 in savings will have uh, an exogenous impact on the economy of between $1.1 and $3.5 million. So this really underscores how important it is for, uh, for us to help folks save. Um, now again, the, the, the impact that each worker's retirement, uh, the impact that, that that retirement savings is gonna have on the economy is is going to vary, <coughs> but um, again, we we base these estimates on uh, employment security data, Department of Revenue data, and we controlled for things like inflation. Uh, we actually took a very conservative approach and kept wages flat. So we're really looking at at a pretty profound impact that legislation like this is going to have. These numbers uh, are the the actual numbers of our expected contribution broken out by, by sector. Uh, as you can see uh, up top here, uh, you know, the, the average contribution uh, is about $60,000. Um, 
the, um, the total investment benefit uh, broken out by sector, uh, the, the average is going to be about $114,000. And then uh, in sum, the expected average total savings by sector is about $173,000. So these are real numbers that um, our uh, analytics team has put together, again, using, uh, using some uh, pretty robust statistical modeling. So again, uh, the, the impact that this is going to have across the board in Illinois is going to be uh, is going to be fairly profound. Um, you know, secure choice isn't going to be the the be all and end all solution to the retirement savings crisis in Illinois, uh, and I don't think any of you expect secure choice type legislation to be the silver bullet in your state, but. Secure Choice is really going to add an additional leg to that to that retirement stool that, that we're all familiar hearing about. Um, I think it, it, it's also fair to point out that um, you know several of us live in states that are cash strapped, and uh, the longer that there are workers who aren't relying on income based. Um, benefit programs uh, when they're older, you know, the, the, the less impact it's going to have on, on our state budgets and our state economy. So uh, I think the, the, the whole impact of this from the worker side to the overall economy side to the state budget side is, is, is profound. Um, so with that, I'm just going to hand it back to Sarah. Great. Thank you very much. And I saw several people curiously taking notes there when you went through some of the data. So will you make their presentation available or Hank, will you have it available? Great. Yeah, I'll, absolutely. And then I'm, I'm happy for, for those of you who are really wonky and want to get into the details of the formulas that we use. I'm happy to, to share some of those as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Now let's move on to Washington. And I, I'm looking forward to hearing from you because um, Senator Mullet, your model is a little bit different. And I know you have personal small business experience. So can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, definitely. And so for my background, I was born and raised here, but my first 13 years after I graduated from Indiana University, I worked in finance. So, you know, when I moved home, I was a managing director at Bank of America. So I had that perspective of being on the financial sector side, and then I opened a Ben and Jerry's ice cream store and a local pizza restaurant when I moved back. So I kind of now had a different angle on this being a small business owner. So I went to actually try to provide some of this. I got elected to the Senate in 2012. And so I was trying to provide some of these retirement options for our staff, and I was personally surprised at the annual admin fees that you would run into, like 1000 bucks a year, $1,500 a year for the business owner to pay. And, and so then you would find some where you're like lower fees, but then like the chamber in the state of Washington has a program for $600, but then they were charging 250 basis points for your staff members in fees. And so I was like, none of these are good options. So. I'll explain our first attempt at legislation in 2014, which did not make it through the process, was a plan that required auto enrollment and then the state investment board for Washington was gonna basically invest it in a target date fund. And so it would be a simple, you know, conservative type of option and, and it would be easy if people switch from my pizza restaurant to somebody else's pizza restaurant, they would obviously just be able to keep the account going. And that passed our Democratic controlled House. The governor would have signed it, but we have a Republican controlled Senate and definitely the influence from the securities industry, SIFMA, and some of the life insurance folks was strong. And so they were s pointing out these ERISA headaches, you know, and as you're in committee, I think going back to Phyllis's comments to open this discussion, it's very daunting in a committee hearing when people start talking about all these ERISA hurdles that you're gonna get shot down and people become nervous. And so this legislation did completely fail in 2014, we could not get through the final hurdle in the Senate. And so then we went back to the drawing board and to SIFMA's credit, they flew out to Seattle. They met to say, we don't wanna say no to everything. We wanna figure out something we can support. And the legislation that ended up going forward that did pass in 2015 was based on the Illinois payroll deduction IRA model. So we avoided all the RISA headaches that they were concerned about. We did not have auto enrollment and it once again goes back to kind of what I heard from Phyllis saying that SIFMA's argument was that auto enrollment would trigger ERISA in the sense that now the employer is clearly involved in the plan. And so they said, we're not trying to trigger ERISA, so auto enrollment was stripped out of our plan. And we created basically 
we call the Washington Retirement Marketplace. And to be on the marketplace, there's two things you have to do. You have to provide a plan that does not charge the business owner the annual admin fee. So that's the first criteria. The second is you can't charge the employee more than 100 basis points in fees to the employee. And so the private sector basically said, we think we can clear that hurdle. And to their credit, I know from my experience as the managing director of Bank of America, they probably will lose money on these accounts for the first four years. Like, you know, my staff is making 30,000 bucks a year. They put 3% in, that's a $900 after the first year. We know that the paperwork headaches associated with that account are not gonna be paid for from a 1% management fee on a $1,000 account. We do think that years five through 30, they could be profitable for the industry by getting a lot more people to start saving. And, and so that was, our plan is voluntary. It's not auto enrollment, but you have this marketplace. We're gonna hopefully have this up and running by the end of next year. We're trying to create rulemaking by the end of, you know, December 31st, 2015. Our goal is to have rules in place in terms of how this will work. And our goal is after the legislative, leg legislative session is done next year that those rules will be formally adopted then in the spring and businesses will be able to say, hey, we wanna get on the marketplace. And at that point, our job is to really promote the hell out of it to make sure all the business owners are aware of it and provide proper incentives. You know, I think we, from California's example, we've discovered a lot of interest from foundations in the space. We're hoping to get money from them to really promote it, provide financial incentives for the business owner, financial incentives, uh, you know, to organizations like the Restaurant Association and, you know, the Chamber of Commerce groups that if they can get more people to enroll, we'll provide money for them. I mean, we're gonna try to really get as many people into the program as quickly as possible, and, and hopefully it ends up being successful and getting a lot of people signed up. Great, thanks, and we're gonna move on to Oregon now, and um, one of the things I'd love you to talk about is a little bit um, the difference between your enforcement mechanisms and some of the other folks on the stage, because I know Illinois has a um, sort of a per head uh, fee if you don't meet the requirements, but Oregon doesn't. So can you talk a little bit about your thinking there? Yeah, sure. Well, f first, the big picture, and then I'll get into the small Please. picture. Big picture is this. Uh, this is an issue that's been with us for a long, long time. 20 years ago, the state of Oregon put forth a task force chaired by a different treasurer to look at the issue of retirement security in our state, and it came to the conclusion that the state of retirement security was abysmal, that if we could not find ways to encourage people to voluntarily save for their own retirement with their own resources, the cost to taxpayers would be staggering. It was acknowledged that Oregon is an aging state in the next 20 years, the uh, over 65 population is expected to double. It was acknowledged that women and minorities and young people are disproportionately impacted by the lack of retirement savings because they tend to be clustered in lower wage, more episodic, smaller business type labor situations. And the grand total of that effort was to create this magnificent, huge, and very heavy report, which then subsequently landed on a shelf. <laughs> Welcome to America. <laughs> In the interceding 20 years, the situation has only gotten significantly worse. And I think sort of the genesis of this next generation, if I can call it that, of people interested in this issue of retirement security comes from the acknowledgement that Congress isn't going to do anything. And let's just be honest about it. This is one of those issues where states need to provide strong leadership if for no other reason than to browbeat Congress into action. Because I think all of us up here would acknowledge that a national solution would probably be lower cost and more efficient and more effective than an individual state solution. That being said, uh, you know, as a state, we move forward. Uh, what John and my plan has in common is both were signed by Governor Brown. I think that's very interesting. That's my only joke today, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> this is Jerry Brown, mine's Kate Brown. That's, that's it, that's as funny as I get as state <laughs> treasurer. That's probably as funny as you want me to get as state treasurer. Uh, our plan was very similar to uh, what you've heard described, particularly by California and Illinois. I want to acknowledge Kristen Johnson in the back of the room. She frankly should be on the stage in my place. She practically drafted the bill. Uh, and I believe she practically drafted the bill by largely lifting all of the language from the Illinois and California <laughs> bills, which for which we're very appreciative. 
Uh, so our plan, uh, you know, when you just cut right down to the chase, auto enroll, IRA like product, auto escalate, pooled and professionally managed resources, uh, transportable, easy to understand, few simple options. They could be lifestyle, it could be a principal press protection type strategy plus other benefits. Uh, all of that is to be determined. The legislation that we passed last session, we decided would not be prescripted. We wanted to go as far as we could in creating a board that would have broad authority to both create and implement a plan without having to go back to the legislature for a second bite of the apple. And that was uh, purely a political decision, but also we wanted a solid board that could actually answer some of the outstanding questions. Uh, I should tell you, um, since the good senator next to me mentioned that he had hands-on experience. By the way, I'm a huge fan of pizza and Ben and Jerry's, <laughs> um, so I'm glad to make your acquaintance. We should talk hey now, more that's often. Two jokes. Uh, I came from the financial services industry. I, I spent 25 years in the industry. Uh, I was a executive leader of a company that designed and sold uh, corporate retirement plans. Um, so there was much that, frankly, I enjoyed calling BS on the table about during our legislative process. First, let's acknowledge a truth. The people we're talking about reaching lower wage, typically minority, typically women, typically younger people working in Oregon for very small businesses, because we're a super small employer state. If we had that 25 person cutoff, that's most of the employers in our state. So th that, that piece wouldn't work uh, for us so much. Um, but I think what we uh, really had to acknowledge on that front is these are nobody's clients, even though there's 30,000 retirement products on the market. They're nobody's clients because they're not profitable clients. Nobody is seeking their uh, uh, participation and uh, the cost and the hassle factor of small businesses and those types of employees participating, frankly, is onerous. So the genesis of our plan is let's figure out what government's good at. What government is good at with this board is providing transparency, accountability, being able to draft the RFP, being very public about it. What the private sector is good at is designing and implementing and operating a plan on behalf of the public sector uh, and doing so under the criteria established by this board that has broad accountability. This is a long way of getting back to your question. Uh, we don't have an enforcement mechanism. It is up to this board to design the enforcement mechanism. They must uh, additionally do a market report, not unlike the one that's been conducted already in the state of Illinois. We greatly admired the fund driving efforts in the state of California, but we did not wish to participate. Therefore, we sought resources to actually fund uh, the first biennium of work on this. So we, we did get resources for about one and a half FTE, plus legal analysis, plus completing the market uh, report, which I think in a state like Oregon is probably much easier than in a state, say, like California, that's much more populous uh, and uh, perhaps more complex in some other regards. The board must report back to the legislature at the end of 2016. That was uh, sort of the first criteria, but there's no vote. It's a report back to the legislature on our progress, and then the plan will be implemented by July 1st of 2017. So I was very happy to hear the deputy secretary uh, this morning talk more about their expeditious approach to this. I think that's really important for the states to be able to have answers to these questions. It's important for the states to be able to collaborate uh, and appreciate uh, the work that each of us are doing to understand what works best with, with the sensibilities in our own states. In Oregon, we're in the process of putting together the board, and like others, it, the board was prescribed by legislation, but it had a bottom line criteria that the people on the board must have experience in retirement planning, saving, 
or administration. And I think that's super important to not have this be a politicized board. There's a time for politics when you're trying to push this through your legislative body, but then there's a time for the politics to go bye-bye and let people who understand the complexities of retirement savings take over the leadership in the crafting, the design, and the implementation of the actual product. Uh, so that's where we are uh, today in that process. Great, thank you. Um, so that everybody's on the same page, what we're going to do now is a uh, lightning round with a couple of questions from me for the folks on the stage, and if you could keep your answers relatively mm -hmm. short, that would be helpful. And then we'll take some questions from the audience, so start thinking about what you might want to ask. Um, the first question I have uh, goes back to a little bit about what we heard this morning from the conversation from the Assistant Secretary, since we're so lucky to have her in the room. Um, it's about employee protections. Have you all thought, this is in particular for Oregon, Illinois, um, and California, although you're welcome to answer as well, but um, your plans are more, a little bit different. So um, one of the concerns that we heard was about um, for plans that are intended to be outside of ERISA, what will states do um, to kind of amp up the employee protections that are out there? And um, are there any learnings that you guys have found from other plans you may run, like 529s or um, deferred compensation that you have pulled from in order to um, put those regulations together? Take your pick, whoever wants to answer first. I will, s I will, s um, I will say from our side, that did come up even though ours is a volunteer approach to the private sector that commerce, our Department of Commerce has to approve anybody who applies to the marketplace and that was specifically put in there so just anybody can't sign up to offer a product that there is gonna be kind of a, you know, we don't think, <laughs> our vision of it is if you have Fidelity and, and Bank of America and, and Vanguard on there that you're not super concerned about them offering a target date fund that's trying to rip off the consumer. But I do think that we felt it was still necessary to have that Department of Commerce check to make sure the people on the marketplace were not gonna be bad for the residents of Washington. Uh, so we, we started with an assumption, which may be a bad assumption, but I like the assumption anyway because it keeps us all honest. We started with the assumption that it doesn't really matter what ERISA says, the state's still going to be liable for the ultimate performance of the plan. And I'm a fiduciary in other respects for the state. I get sued from time to time. I assume that the board is a fiduciary regardless of whether a court later determines that the state is not a fiduciary. We're gonna act and behave as though we are fiduciaries. We still have the right explicitly if we have a provider who engages in fraud or deceit or misrepresentation to go after them. And we have a reputation for doing that in the state of Oregon. And we will most certainly hold them to a high standard in this regard. Um, one just sort of interesting question that I'll put out there for the assistant secretary is, is it possible to conceive of a ruling or guidance whereby the state itself or the board is subject to ERISA but the employers are not by virtue of the fact that they do not participate voluntarily. I probably should have mentioned that in Oregon, uh, all employers are subject to this. Uh, any individual in the state of Oregon who is employed for compensation, who does not have access to a retirement plan through their place of employment is eligible. The board may create a hardship process for certain uh, types of businesses and agriculture certainly comes to mind, but sort of our ferreting through the ERISA language suggested to us, let's mandate it and then create a hardship out rather than giving people the option to opt in because we worried that that sounded too much like an endorsement. California, you wanna have? Go ahead. Sure, I, uh, I'm gonna take it in a slightly different direction. The, the treasurer, uh, covered several of the, the issues that we discussed and considered in Illinois. One of the conversations that's going on with the secure choice legislation has to do with the consumer protection side. And there, there are several advocacy groups that are looking at the way that secure choice is, is constructed um, and, and really want to make sure that there are tight controls on, on conversions. So uh, if we hire investment managers or when we hire investment managers to, to manage secure choice program, we wanna make sure that like in uh, our in-state deferred compensation program, uh, 
those private investment managers can't convert secure choice investors into a different financial product within that, that, uh, within that company. Um, there, there's uh, a lot of interesting literature out on this phenomenon and we wanna, you know, we, it's something we're certainly considering. Um, I think that the, the kicker to this comment uh, is that um, the Secure Choice Board that manages the program in, in Illinois um, really does have the be all and end all say with how these programs are constructed and which consumer protections are in place. But, but th that I would highlight as one of, the, one of the big things that we've been hearing a lot about in Illinois is, is that conversion issue. So we were, we were looking at reducing the number of choices people have uh, because obviously people get confused when there's uh, they're overwhelmed by the number of choices. So I've w as we reduce the number of choices people have, we're looking between three to seven to nine. Uh, we're looking for additional features and clearly one of the most important features that we asked the market research team to do was how do we ensure the consumer protections and what features best do we see being offered? And a quick follow-up, maybe by a show of hands or no head nods. Do you all have mandatory auditing in your bills? Is it all required? Yes, yes or no? It, it's not required in the bill as drafted. That's left to rulemaking. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about challenges. Um, I think uh, it's pretty interesting. We, we, we have been talking about this for quite some time. It's a phenomenon that's really grown exponentially, right? I mean, a couple when California was starting out, it was just you guys in the Wild West, and now it's you know half the country that's considering this type of um, movement. So my question is, what challenges did you think were going to materialize that didn't? Or what were challenges that, that materialized that you didn't expect? Okay, so I will say that I think the main going to, f it's great that Phyllis is here. I do think the primary <laughs> challenge is if you're in a state, you know, where, you know, the financial service industry has a fair amount of power and, uh, and that's probably 30 states in the country. <laughs> I don't think there's any way to, to move this legislation forward without doing these, you know, payroll deduction IRA type options unless we get some real clear guidance from DC that you're not gonna be triggering a bunch of ERISA nightmares for the state to go down this path. And I, I think that is the primary hurdle that hopefully we can get cleared up in the next six months because I think in any, s that the industry has such a strong argument to come in and just scare everyone to death that they're going down a path of complete total misery that they're all gonna regret if they move this bill off the floor. And until we get better guidance from DC on this issue, it's really hard for, I think, a lot of states to make a lot of progress on this. And, and I think we have gone into this payroll deduction IRA world because of that. And so hopefully that's something I think is the primary challenge that, that would have to get resolved going forward. And I didn't expect that coming in to the whole process when we started this in 2014 of doing committee hearings. I, was, I just thought people would raise ERISA objections and it was you know, wasn't gonna carry a lot of weight, but that seemed to be the one that everyone was leaning back on of why the bill was getting shot down. So uh, my biggest surprise was how vociferously the industry argued against their own best interest. If I'm in an, I mean, we're in Seattle, so we'll use the Starbucks model. I remember when Starbucks was locating in Portland, you know, that's the worst thing you can do, for those of you not from the East Coast, is be a Seattle business locating in <laughs> Portland and have it be a large business that is uh, at least potentially seen as a threat to small independent businesses where you don't have to wear shoes or whatever when you go in. But the reality of what happened with Starbucks and its global expansion is they expanded the market share for everybody because they got people who didn't drink coffee to drink coffee and they got people who were used to a 75 cent cup of coffee to pay three and a half bucks for it. So all of a sudden they created room under the umbrella for independent chains and independent operators to actually be successful in an expanding market. I would argue that the same thing will happen here. Uh, I already said quite deliberately that these are nobody's clients. If your business model is assets under management, 
then obviously small, fragmented, episodic, low-wage workers aren't your market share. So in comes the state, California, then Illinois, and then the rest of us, saying, hey, we're going to pool these resources. We'll create a model that's you know, mandated, auto-enroll, and we're going to pool these resources, and then we're going to hang it out there through an RFP process for the private sector to compete against each, each other for what I think is a potentially very lucrative pool, assets under management. So I sat there just sort of scratching my head the whole time, wondering why would you turn down this gift-wrapped package? And then I realized the industry is fragmented, and I want you folks who are about to legislate to know this that there are those in the financial industry who are very enthusiastic about this, those who see this as an entry-level process to get people to begin to save for retirement. Independent financial advisors love that. You're helping them with financial literacy and encouraging the behavior of saving some of their payroll for retirement. Then there's the large financial industry you know, institutions, think Tia Kreff or Oleg Mason or something like that. Uh, they're generally understanding the economic hydraulics. In our state, we had an insurance company that worked so hard to kill this bill. You know, we're not thinking annuities, which is an insurance product, which is what they sell, but then it occurred to me what the game might be, and here's my conspiracy theory, and then I'll shut up, but I enjoy <laughs> sowing the seeds of dissent. Um, I think they were worried about a large multinational diversified financial institution coming into the state of Oregon and doing a great job on this plan and making a lot of money off of it and encouraging an entire generation of savers and then saying, oh, by the way, we sell other products too, like annuities. And so when people come in and start selling you, understand everybody's got some vested interest in this and just remember that the goal here is to protect your citizens and to protect your state's finances because as I say, if we don't do anything, the trend line is clear. We're hockey sticking as people rely instead on costly government safety net services. That's great, I, I, I would agree uh, that one of the things that surprises me most is that the financial industry doesn't speak with one voice on this issue, so it's pretty interesting. Um, do either of you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I think there's well, there's a lot of uh, exciting positive developments. Not directly be on point in regards to this, but it's the discussion of how people got to this point without the without retirement security. And so you look at what's happening with uh, volatility of income. You look at emergencies. You look at the cost of health care, and you look at as Ted was talking about earlier the development of the new financial products that need to take place in addition to the retirement security products. AARP is engaged in those types of discussions. And then as a, a second point, and totally different, I do town halls on these issues. So the mix between those who are, are opposed but trying to be constructive and those in the asset building community and what additional features they want uh, is incredibly vast. So I think it really enhances the opportunities of what the final product's going to look like. Juno, anything? Yeah, I, I, I think the... Um, both anticipated and unanticipated challenges we're encountering in Illinois is something that most folks in this room are probably familiar with and, and, and could have bet on as well, and that's just uh, politics. Um, and I, I, I think I'm going to kind of segue into the next question a little bit here. When Secure Choice was, um, was, was being argued in the legislature, there was a Democratic governor, uh, a Republican treasurer, and the Republican treasurer wanted absolutely nothing to do with the secure choice legislation. So several um, checks were built into the legislation to ensure that both the legislature had a voice, the governor had a voice, and the treasurer had a voice. Well, we're now kind of in an opposite situation where there is a Democratic treasurer who's very much in favor of secure choice, and there's a Republican governor, there's still a, a Democratic legislature, but we are now in the position where <coughs> we are jumping through the hoops that were set up for, uh, for a Republican treasurer. And, or I shouldn't say a Republican treasurer, but rather a treasurer who, who didn't see the value in secure choice type legislation. Um, I, I think it was Ted who alluded to um, 
ongoing amendments and how these 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 bills are evolving. Um, you know, the the final secure choice legislation went through nine amendments. Uh, this spring legislative session, you submitted several amendments. So there are um, there are there are issues in the law that make it more difficult for the treasurer's office to actually implement the program uh, in in the way that we want. And so we're trying to work around work around that. Can I ask something? What, Please. What are, what are the what are the impediments specifically? Uh, it, well, so first of all, um, the Secure Choice Board uh, process. Um, the Secure Choice Board uh, is comprised of seven individuals, uh, two representing employers, <coughs> two representing um, employees, a representative or the treasurer, uh, the comptroller, and a representative from the governor's office of management and budget. The four at will positions are nominated by the governor, confirmed or approved by the treasurer, and then confirmed by the state legislature. So again, nominated by the governor, approved by the treasurer, confirmed by the state legislature. So Horrible. it's, it's um, yeah, it, it, it was, again, by design. Um, but surprisingly, uh, we anticipated that this would be a very laborious and difficult process. Um, our staff, uh, including uh, Deputy Treasurer Rao, uh, have done a great job in navigating that process. And instead of being a contentious debate, um, the establishment of the board um, went smoother than we anticipated. We didn't anticipate having to dismantle or, or kind of unwind this, this, this ball of, of uh, restrictions, but I think the board example is probably the best one, and there are examples of that littered throughout the legislation. I think that's great, and actually, I, it's a really good point because it's something that I've heard from multiple states. So we, we've now heard that a little bit from Treasurer Wheeler saying that you know let's it's time to move beyond politics. We're in the implementation phase. I'm hearing it from you. I've heard it from Connecticut and other states as well. So I think that's a really hopeful sign. Um, maybe Washington, Washington proper, <laughs> can take some cues from the states. Well, so G Governor Rauner has and his staff have said. Um, you know, we're, we're not interested in killing this. It's law, we're in the implementation phase. So, so that was certainly very, very encouraging. For sure. So um, we have 15 minutes left. I'm gonna ask one more question and then kick it um, to the folks in the room. So I'm gonna hold you all to the one minute response time, um, which I know is tough because this question is big. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, education and outreach in the community, in particular in Washington State, where you've got a completely voluntary program and the small business has to decide that they wanna offer this. So um, what are you guys planning in terms of rollout or education? I think you hit it on the head. I mean, it is about, you have to make everyone aware of the program. So once we're ready to start marketing, which I think will be next year, we, my personal, this is Mark Mullet speaking, not necessarily the Department of Commerce, but I think you have to take advantage of all the groups that are out there, whether it's NFIB or it's, you know, AWB, the Association of Washington Business, the Retail Federation, the Restaurant Association, all the groups who tend to have a lot of members who fall into these categories of having people work for small businesses where people are making 30,000 bucks a year. And I think you have to clearly provide some financial incentives for those people to get their members to sign up. At the same token, as a business owner, if somebody, like the example I use is if you get five bucks per member, per employee, you sign up. So I have 50 people at Zeke's and Ben and Jerry's. And so if I go from, you know, 2015, where me to set up this plan cost me 1,500 bucks a year, where I have to write a check, to if somebody's gonna pay me five bucks an employee to enroll, and I get a check from the state for $250, that's a big delta. So you go from having to write a big check to all of a sudden getting a small amount of money, but still, it's an amount of money for doing what you think is the right thing to do anyways. So I think the more you can try to incentivize those small business owners and the organizations that they're a part of is gonna be how you're gonna do it. More than focusing on the employees, it's gonna be really targeting all your efforts on the business owner themselves. Useful, and let, let me just preface the, the, the remaining three. Um, what about the flip side of that? Have you had any experience, um, especially for California with your, um, your focus groups? Have you had any experience messaging automatic enrollment to businesses or the requirements to businesses? Uh, what's that been like? Well, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, we have what I would call associations um, 
organizations that cultivate a mailing list and purport to speak on behalf of large groups of diverse individuals and interests. And some of them came out strongly opposed to this bill. Uh, one representing small businesses in our state described it as dangerous. I found that fascinating because the bill hadn't been drafted yet, nor had it been submitted. So I wanted to know what the bill was. Um, the reality is when it came time to seek testimony, not a single business owner or operator testified that the requirements of what we were proposing were either costly or onerous. The provision of forms, they already do that. Payroll deductions, they already do that. And so uh, really, I'm not all that worried about it. My, my thinking was from a construct perspective, we address that question. Make it easy, simple, minimalistic, low cost, uh, and that'll solve a lot of the problems. You're not gonna solve the massive problem of financial illiteracy in this country through this retirement planning process. You don't believe me? Watch TV tonight at eight o'clock and you'll get a first-hand <laughs> example I mean of how bad financial literacy is concerned. in our country. Five <laughs> <jokes>. <laughs> All right. yeah, California. It's, it's continuous learning. So the, as I mentioned, we're doing a, a series of quote-unquote town halls with various groups. So we're certainly meeting with uh, big chamber, small chamber, members of NFIB, uh, ethnic chambers, other types of business organizations. And so we get a lot of their language. Uh, so we use automatic payroll, something that we heard at, and I can't thank Angela. At automatic payroll deposit. Deposit, so uh, when we Not went to plan. the Small Business Association, they said like automatic payroll contribution. So we, that's what our small business uh, groups uh, advocated for. And so uh, they've been very encouraging uh, in, that, uh, in that particular regard. Uh, one of the things that they wanted us to continue to <coughs> do is to, actually they brought to us and to Department of Labor and said, contemplate is like, we wanna make contributions too. But what we were concerned about is if they start making contributions, you know, do, are they gonna withdraw from their plans and no longer offer you know, what we continue to see today? And so we didn't wanna go down, we didn't wanna go that pathway, but uh, it's the Secure Choice Board, it wasn't gonna pose that question in our letter to Department of Labor, but certain, there are certain elements that wanna say, hey, the employees, when we focus group them, they also want those plans where the employer would continue to make contributions. They said they created greater incentive. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the differences for Washington, right? You include the simple in your list of um, potential earnings. So, Julian? So I'm, I'm gonna answer the question two ways. One is talk about kind of a macro issue we're dealing with in the state of Illinois. Um, most of you have probably heard about uh, some budget and pension challenges in the state of Illinois. And we are now going to be rolling out a plan that's going to be asking employers and employees to participate in the program where they're giving, effectively giving the state money. Um, it's, it's been a challenging kind of marketing question uh, that, that we've had to disabuse a lot of folks. Uh, the notion that this is like a state pension um, is, is wrong. I think the, the 529 model is, is what we point to in response. Uh, these are conservative, long-term investments that, that are safe. Uh, it's a public-private partnership where uh, financial managers are going to come in and manage a myriad of, of different options. So I'd say kind of the biggest message and hurdle that, that we've encountered so far is is this perception of uh, you know the the uh, relatively dismal state of uh, state of Illinois' economy, uh, or I'm sorry, the the budget and pensions. Um, the the second uh, way I'm going to answer your question is just to refer back to some of the slides that that I showed. Uh, th those numbers broken out by industry sector represent actual workers. Those are individuals, um, and so. We're really going to focus on messaging directly to that that one forestry worker or that one uh, healthcare and human services worker, as well as their employer. Um, we uh, we've been able to come up with a way where we can actually message directly to those individuals about what's coming, um, and we are going to uh, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time over the next couple years talking about what secure choice is, 
what it means, what the investment options are, and eventually we're going to be doing what, what John's doing with the treasurer and deputy treasurer going out and, and meeting with these folks, having town hall meetings to answer questions, because th there is a lot of uncertainty about this. Great, great answers. Um, I'm going to take questions from the audience. We've got a few minutes. Does anybody have one? There are several. Let's get a microphone down here. Um, ha have any of this? Have any of you looked at the use of the my IRA uh, that Treasury proposed, which you know, is certainly an interesting entry level investment for people who don't want to risk capital? I can. Uh, well, that is part of the. Re that was the request from SIPMA was that be part of the retirement, the Washington model, is that Myra is going to be on the marketplace. So the, like Fidelity would have to offer either a target date fund or a balance fund, but also on the marketplace is going to be the Myra information to help people enroll if they want to do Myra instead. And that was a requirement of the legislation in Washington to try to promote Myra so it doesn't just die a death, that it, we're going to try to market as much as possible. I know there have been some different reactions too. Does anybody else want to, I don't know. Well, well, to, to Ted's point, um, Senator Biss in Illinois was the, was adamant about the automatic um, payroll deposit, um, and by having that as a part of the Secure Choice legislation, uh, we're able to achieve the economy of scale uh, that makes this you know high transaction, low dollar amounts um, uh, attractive to financial managers. Um, because Myra lacks that component, um, you know, we've, we've, um, we're hesitant to, to look at how that could work with secure choice. However, we, we are in ongoing conversations with Treasury about Myra and how we might be able to fold it in with, uh, with secure choice. So I wasn't sure the question, did you say, did, are we thinking about Myra or are you thinking, was the question, are we thinking about a Myra type model? The, uh, so we talk about Myra, but the, as, as Julian just said, the big focus on us, if you really want people to retire, right, you don't want them to think about it, you want just that feature they're automatically enrolled, then they can think about opting out. Great, next question. Thank you, Julie State Representative from Washington State. Uh, Two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, I heard Roth IRAs. Are any of you considering regular IRAs in case, let's say, the owner uh, employer wants to uh, participate, but Roth IRAs don't make sense to them, but regular IRAs do? And then the second part is conversions are prohibited, but will you be allowing rollover IRAs? Julian, you want to take that? Uh, sure. Um, the the short answer to both your questions is um, I can't really answer either of your questions. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the Secure Choice Board is ultimately going to uh, have the final say on what, what products are offered, but um, everything that you've mentioned right now is on the table. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at that as well. We, we left it to rulemaking. I think it will be a robust debate. I'll tell you my view. My view is that the population we are trying to reach, I am extremely hopeful that when they retire, they will be in a higher tax bracket. So maybe that hints at the way I feel about where the tax advantage should be. That being said, the opposite scenario is probably easier to understand and implement. So that's going to be the debate. Right. Just to add, I, I think I, we've had the conversation many times in state that uh, in all the legislation that the deferred revenue is always going to be um, a, a conversation that comes up. Whether or not that's a red herring or a real issue, we can have a um, debate about that. But that's also something that comes up. So I'll follow up on Ted. So we're, we're the tail end of that thinking. We, the, we're looking at both, but we prefer the tax advantage. So. so uh, I don't know if this is working. Yeah, it is working. Uh, so the employer, the absence of a, a pension plan is a trigger, so an employer develops a pension plan when they've enrolled people in these plans. Does that automatically mean those people unenroll themselves, or what is the impact if the employer decides to develop a pension plan? That's one question. And I think the other question that my colleague here asked is, 
employer contributions you kind of left that employer contribution piece out of your 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 discussions here and what what rules in these different plans what is the cap on employer crap contributions or or is there any sorry so secure choice in illinois um, is only subject to employers that don't offer a pension or 401k style retirement plan um, i think that answers your question right so it uh, I, I think I can speak for Treasurer Frerichs when I say if the result of the secure choice legislation in Illinois is that every employer who doesn't currently offer a plan creates one on their own and we don't take a single dollar, we would, we would be happy with that. Um, we would be very happy with that. Yeah, I, I don't want to be provocative. That's my second joke for the day. Um, <laughs> this, this is not a platinum retirement plan. What we're offering up, and, and first of all, the, the answer is the same. If you have your own plan, uh, you're good to go. You're not subject to this whatsoever. If uh, somebody creates a plan that's better than what we're offering, uh, again, we're happy, good to go, we'll send them flowers. The reality is the plan that we are creating is what I would describe, and, and I don't necessarily want this in the press, but it's an easy way to think about it. This is a minimum <coughs> wage strategy for retirement savings. So it's a bare bones, low cost, simple, no bells and whistles, entry level, first time ever saving for retirement kind of plan. And it is not best practice. Best practice would also encourage employers to make voluntary contributions on top of those contributions as an incentive to encourage even higher rates of participation and higher levels of savings. Uh, but that was pretty clear to us, at least the people who give us legal advice, that we just we couldn't have employer contributions in addition to what was already being uh, uh, withheld from the employees' paychecks. Right, and just to clarify, that's on the last one more question, um, okay. and to clarify too, um, the Washington State plan is a little different because the marketplace does include options which would allow for employer contributions. So that is a little different as well as what we talked about this morning in terms of um, plans that could be created under ERISA, such as a, a, a MEP or a 401k, would allow for employer contributions. So there's a wide range in terms of what's out there. You're seeing um, you know, a sliver of what's going on. So we'll take one more question. Uh, well, actually, I wanted to add. So we're between Oregon and Illinois. So California is five or more employees. Right, and so in our letter to that was sent to the Department of Labor, or actually Kane Elliott, but he's done it through us. You know, we acknowledge that you can't have employer contributions. You know, th the best plan at the end of the day is have the employer contributions. So I wish we didn't have to offer this plan, but we have to because we have to cover the 6.3 million. The best plan is if the, if, the, if the employer has a plan and they're making contributions, which is a huge incentive for the employees to also make those contributions. And then they meet the minimum requirement and it's no longer applicable in that case. Next question. Hi, I'm uh, Rich Jones uh, with a policy group in Colorado. We've been advocating for one of these plans um, there. And you'd mentioned early on about the uh, security um, industry and how much they've opposed some of the bills, but that there are other segments of the industry that may actually benefit from these plans and wanting to maybe manage the pool of investments and that sort of thing. We did have PIA CREF um, support our bill. I was curious if you had other groups in your states that, that on that side, on the, uh, on the financial industry supporting the bill, who are they and, and <coughs> how did you get them sort of to that spot of supporting it? So we had independent financial advisors who saw it as a clear win. Uh, and we also had what I would call more progressive small business group representatives uh, saying that this is something they want to offer to their employees and some of the most compelling testimony we received <coughs> was from small employers who had tried to create a retirement plan for their employees but found the cost or the hassle factor too significant to be able to participate and so this this for them seems like a really good option for them to be able to offer their employees. I will, I will say locally Russell Investments who's a local company in Seattle was very supportive of our legislation and so they definitely were yeah they they did a lot of work to help the bill pass I, I think the reaction is is going to depend a lot on the legislation that that's crafted uh, in Illinois during the legislative process the financial industry was by and large supportive um, and so you know we, di we didn't have the same challenges that that some other states had in terms of opposition from the financial industry 
and the financial industry was uh, was opposed in uh, in California. Uh, but while in the uh, design of the program, we have some life insurers who are are more open. The officially the position of the industry is they're opposed, but those who see an opportunity to get business under this plan are say taking a wait and see attitude. And I would so also add just uh, from what I've seen in other states as well, um, ASPA. Um, whatever the new acronym is, which I'll never remember. ASPA has come out um, and said m many in many places that they support it, as well as um, minority-owned investment firms, Cabrera, Ariel, um, the like in Maryland. We've seen Lake Mason. We've seen T. Rowe Price come out in different places. So I would say, you know, definitely broaden the amount of the, the people that you're talking to about this. So, And we are over time, so I'm going to pass it back to Hank. <laughs>